you've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. You want to work in the light. And why is that? Well, because the light, when you draw a light on something, it shows the flaws. Oh man, I need to work on this edge here. I need to fix this. Light exposes flaws, right? It helps you to see the truth, see what's really going on so you can make it right. Uh, or think about it this way, no surgeon who's skilled in his craft, no surgeon operates in darkness, right? In fact, if you've ever seen an operating room, I mean, there's lights all over the place. That thing is so lit up, there are no shadows. Isn't it interesting how when you step out into the sunlight, everything becomes noticeable, good or bad? In today's teaching, Pastor Ron expresses how that's actually a positive thing, that flaws are exposed and that things are seen as they truly are. This is how your life should be too, exposing those areas that need to come out into the light to be shown to others. If you stay hidden in the darkness, the parts of you that can and should be improved upon remain in the shadows. So come out into the light. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Ephesians chapter 5 with today's edition of Large Than Life. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Now, the Greek manuscripts vary on this word fruit. Some say light. The word light would actually be better rendered because that's, of course, the theme of this passage. Certainly, walking in the light will produce the fruit of the Spirit, But what Paul is describing here is the fruit of a life that walks in the light. If you happen to have an NIV, it puts both of them there. It says this, the fruit of the light is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. So you get the idea. That's the thrust of what Paul is saying here. Paul's point is this, where there is spiritual life, a person's a Christian, there's going to be spiritual fruit. Where there is a person who is a child of the light, there will be fruit of that light, right? Right? Jesus said, you'll know men by their fruits. There's going to be evidence. By the way, let me say this. Every true believer bears fruit. Do you know that? I mean, that's a fact. There's no such thing, absolutely no such thing as a fruitless believer, a fruitless Christian. Jesus said this in John 15, 4. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me bears fruit. You will bear fruit. And then he goes on to say, I've chosen you, I've ordained you, that you should bring forth fruit, and your fruit will remain. So if you're truly a believer, you'll have fruit, it'll remain, and I'm taking you on into glory. Now, that said, every true believer has fruit, but of course, we don't all bear the same kind of fruit. And there are some Christians that are truly believers, but they don't have a lot of fruit, right? They just have tiny little things, they look like the size of raisins, a little bit of fruit, right? Maybe because of carnality or whatever it is. If there's no fruit, if someone says they're a believer but there's absolutely no fruit, then the fact is they're not saved. Jesus illustrated, we saw this in Matthew chapter 21, when he came to the fig tree that was saying, I'm producing fruit, but it was leaves only, and Jesus cursed it. Why? Leaves only, no fruit. So Paul gives us here three characteristics of walking in the light. Three tangible fruits that we ought to see in the life of a person who says, I'm a believer. The first is goodness. That word in the original language means moral, spiritual excellence. There's a moral, spiritual excellence that comes out of the believer. And by the way, our goodness, of course, comes from God. We're told in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4, it's the goodness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. So we learn goodness from God. We learn goodness from our Savior, Jesus. We're told in Acts 10, 38, that Jesus went about doing good. I love the way William Tyndale put it. He put it this way, God's goodness is the root of all goodness, and our goodness, if we have any, springs forth from his goodness. That's true. So Paul is saying, if you're walking in light, you're going to bear fruits of goodness. And it's not just saying good things, it's living it. It's being an example of it. It's been said that Benjamin Franklin wanted to convince the citizens of Philadelphia to light the streets at night. If they lit the streets at night, he says it would help from protection of crime and it would be convenience to those traveling through cities. When he failed to influence them by his words, he bought an attractive lantern and placed it in a long bracket in the front of his house. This was the first street light. Each evening he lit the wick and his neighbors noticed the warm glow in front of his house. Those who passed by appreciated the light and soon others began placing lanterns in front of their homes too and eventually the whole city was doing it. 
That's the way the walking in the light is. It's not just saying it, it's doing it. It's living it. There's an attractiveness there. There's a goodness towards others. The second fruit, he says, is righteousness. And this word in the original language means a rightness or a right living towards God. Romans 6.13, I think, is a good illustration of it where Paul says, don't present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present them as members of righteousness to God. Righteousness is how I live my life before God, how I walk before God. So the question is, is my walk, is it pleasing to the Lord? Not just when others are looking, but when God's looking. And of course, he's looking all the time. Greg Laurie tweeted the other day, the measure of a real man's character is what he would do if he were never caught. Wow. What does God see? How do I live before him? So here's the thing. The fruit of goodness is how I live before others. The fruit of righteousness is how I live before God. And then there's a third fruit here, and it's the fruit of truth. And the Greek word here is aletheia. It means absolute truth truth. Same word Jesus used speaking of himself in John 14, 6, when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And of course, that's real truth, right? Divine truth. Later, Jesus said in John 17, 17, God's word is truth. Speaking of the scriptures, this is our foundation. Now, Paul's point is this. If we're true believers, if we're children of the way, the truth, and the life, And if we're reading God's word, which is the truth, that ought to be exemplified in our life. We ought to be people of integrity. That's what people ought to see. Think of how we would stand out as light in the world if we live by integrity. Because that's a hard word. It's a hard thing to actually see in people's lives today. I mean, where do you look? Who do you trust today? Who can you really count on? Is there any more integrity? Church, family, friends. You know, the reality is it's really hard to find people you can trust because we don't see a whole lot of integrity. But that should be the fruit of us walking in the light, that people see our lives as truth. Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine that people may see your good works and glorify our Father in heaven. We should be beacons of truth. And so as we walk in the light, we reflect the light. It's evidenced in goodness as I walk before others. It should be evidenced in righteousness, how I walk before God. And it should be evidenced in truth, how I live in integrity before the world. Man, something that's so needed. Notice he adds in verse 10, proving what is acceptable to the Lord. When I walk this way, that is acceptable to the Lord. That's what the Lord wants. Colossians 1.10 says, uh, Paul is praying that we would have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. So when we're walking worthy of the Lord, when we're walking in light, that pleases the Lord. And so we have the contrast. We were once darkness, now we're the light. And Paul says, then walk in the light. What does that look like? The characteristics, goodness, righteousness, and truth, or integrity. Now, Paul's not through. Having shown us what to do, he now moves on and tells us what not to do. And, and I call this the command, beginning in verse 11. He puts it, says it right up front, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. That word fellowship means to join with or partner with. As Christians, we're not to partner with the world. Uh, the term, the unfruitful works of darkness, that's just a general term to describe the world. Now, does that mean that absolutely everything in the world is evil? No. There are things in the world that are helpful. There are kind people in the world that do nice things. There are even unbelievers who feed the poor, clothe the needy. There are unbelievers who work in food kitchens, who build homes for the underprivileged. Those are good things. But in the final analysis, all of those things, that's just, that's just temporal. And without the message and without a change through faith in Jesus Christ, our life at the end is fruitless. In fact, Doing good works, which a lot of people in the world do, can give a person a false sense of security, thinking, I'm okay before God, when in fact they're not. Only faith in Jesus Christ 
Now, in this passage, though, Paul is referring to, when he talks about these unfruitful works of darkness, most likely he's referring to what he just taught in the earlier verses. These works, as he referred to, would be in verses 1 through 7, you know, anger and stealing and bitterness and evil speaking and fornication and covetousness and idolatry. Those are definitely unfruitful works of the world. We're not to have fellowship with those things. We shouldn't be identified if we're walking in light with those things. Now, if I shouldn't be identified with those things, let me ask the question, though. Does that mean that I can't be associated with people who do those things? And I'd like to say, actually, no. And what I mean by that is, if I'm to be the light of the world, I have to let my light shine. I have to be in the world. I am in the world, as Jesus said, but I am not of the world. So this is a warning. He, he's saying you need to walk in light. You need to not be involved with those unfruitful works of darkness. Nonetheless, I need to let my light shine. So I need to be careful as I rub shoulders with the world that they're not rubbing off on me, but rather I'm making an effect on them. In fact, he adds in verse 11, rather expose them. I should be exposing those things just as I'm let, walking light. I'm like, woo, you know, here I am. Light exposes. When you go in a room and you flick the switch, right, all of a sudden there's light. Now, our exposure as walking light is sometimes very direct, right? But there are also times where just walking light is very indirect. What do I mean by that? Well, indirectly, just the fact that as a Christian, I'm not going to participate in some things that other people choose to do that. That is definitely an indirect testimony, right? I'm not going to partake in dishonest endeavors of the world. When someone is talking bad about someone else behind their back, I'm going to walk away. I'm not going to be involved in that. And the things that we abstain from are definitely a ray of light on darkness of the world that practices all those things. That's definitely indirectly walking light. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to be involved in those things. But I also need to know that there are times when a silent witness is not enough. In fact, there are some times that as a Christian, my silence can actually encourage other people to think that I'm okay with it. In such a case, walking light means I'm not just indirectly walking light, and just as I'm living my life quietly, there are times I have to really step up and I have to say, hey, this is the way it is. And a lot of Christians fall back from doing that. And maybe you, you're, you're fearful of doing that. But listen, we're living in a day and age we better be ready to stand up because persecution can be right around the corner. And we, and we need to be willing to stand up and step up for Christ. Now, standing up and letting our light shine doesn't mean that we need to be obnoxious when we're talking about the Lord. You know, saying to someone, you know, your works are an abomination to the Lord. Thou wilt go to hell if I continue this way. <laughs> you know, you're not going to win too many people over that way. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us that love does not act unbecomingly. Another way to say it is love isn't obnoxious. The truth is, if we really care for someone and there's a situation going on and I'm walking in light, I have to share the truth. I'm going to do so in love because I want to see these people turn. But I have to speak up. So Ephesians 4, 15, if you remember, kind of puts the two together. Speaking the truth in love. If it's all love, it can just be wishy-washy, right? No truth. But if it's all truth, it can be harsh. So it's speaking the truth in love. Those two are wed together. Paul adds in verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them and in secret. So we should be walking alive, exposing things that are in darkness. And he says it's actually shameful to speak of those things. Now, exposing darkness is also important to make sure that we don't go into the depths of it. In other words, always speaking about it. I guess for me, one of the best examples is this. And I've done this before, that there are sometimes that people will share their testimony as believers. And they begin to paint the picture of their past, right? When they were in darkness. But it sometimes seems that they're licking their chops when they're talking. And then I did this. And then I did this. Ooh. And I went to this club. And it was awesome. And there was all these people there. And, and it, it almost seems like they're enjoying the darkness. And you're thinking, you know, what's wrong here? You know, they're talking about 80% of the darkness and very little about the light. Well, Paul tells us here it's shameful to even talk about those things of darkness. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't engage or talk about those things, of what Christ has done, but I think we need to be careful. We don't need to jump back into the garbage can again and dig up all the junk to get our point across. We need to be careful. We should be exposing works of darkness and not boasting about what we did in our darkness, but it's shameful. So there needs to be a balance. Uh, Romans 16, 19 says this, be wise in what is good. So we should be wise in the things that are good and very simple concerning 
sin or the flesh or evil. I, I think of it this way. Let's say you work with teenagers. You work with young adults. That doesn't mean you have to watch all of the garbage on TV and keep up on all the stuff to be relatable to them. You don't have to do that. I've heard Christian youth workers, they'll say that. Man, I have, to, I have to watch MTV. I have to watch all the sick. And I have to do all that stuff so I can be relatable. No, you don't. No, you don't. So we have to be careful. We have to be discerning. We have to be wise. Paul says it's, it's shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. So exposing darkness, but careful in the way we do it. Verse 13, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. So light ultimately exposes the true character of things. If you're an artist, um, and maybe you work with uh, you know, carving, whether it's stone or you, maybe you work with wood, right? You, you want to work in the light. And why is that? Well, because the light, when you draw light on something, it shows the flaws. Oh, man, I need to work on this edge here. I need to fix this. Light exposes flaws, right? It helps you to see the truth, see what's really going on so you can make it right. Uh, or think about it this way. No surgeon who's skilled in his craft, no surgeon operates in darkness, right? In fact, if you've ever seen an operating room, I mean, there's lights all over the place. That thing is so lit up. There are no shadows. And that light makes manifest. It shows the true condition of what's going on. We should thank God that, first of all, he shines his light on us, right? He does that in my life all the time. Ron, this needs to be changed. You need to make adjustments here. Hey, there's gray here. There's shadows here. It needs to be corrected. God does so because he loves us so that we make change. So light exposes what's wrong in order to make adjustments. Another thing about light is light gives guidance, Right? If you're in darkness, you got a flashlight, you, can, you got the flashlight, you can see where you're going. We all have headlights on our cars in the evening, so you can see where you're going. I, you know, some of the, the headlights, by the way, get so much better as the years go on in vehicles. My dad had Model A's, you know. These things, first of all, so, a long time ago, they had candles in those things, right? Then they heated them up with kerosene, and now you have, you have the dull lights, and you know some of these, I do how the lights are so much brighter now in the cars, and some of you guys have cars, one of the cars that we have, the lights actually turn a little bit before we do the turn, like this, like, oh, that's awesome. I just like turning because the light's there, you know, kind of. but light gives you direction, helps you to see clearly where you're going, and how we need, how we need that, how we should be thankful for that, and that's how we should live, helping give people guidance and direction. So Paul tells us, the contrast, you were once darkness, now you're light, walk in the light. What does that look like? What are its characteristics? Goodness, righteousness, truth. But he also gives us command. As you rub shoulders with the world, make sure you're not becoming like the world, but rather you're exposing those things. Be careful how you talk, because it's shameful to even talk about those things. Be wise, be discerning, and let your light shine, because it'll expose and let people make adjustments, and it'll give solid direction. Well, finally, this leads us to a call here in verse 14. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Now, it's interesting, as I was studying this, there are a lot of scholars who believe that this verse was actually part of an early church hymn. In fact, it's actually believed that they sang it at their water baptisms, you know. As a, as a person was getting water baptized, as they were coming out of the water, the congregation would sing this song, you know, symbolic of what Christ did, you know. Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, Christ has given you light, you know, new life kind of a thing. Now, in context, though, it is clear that the Holy Spirit has placed this here as a call primarily to call people that haven't come to the light to be saved. But also, this is a call to believers who have perhaps fallen asleep spiritually, who have perhaps become lukewarm. Maybe that's you tonight. Maybe you've allowed yourself to live in such a way that a lot of your Christian walk is not so much in the light, but it's more in the gray, right? Your mindset is, how much can I get away with and still be a Christian? That's living in the gray. Rather than being in the light saying, how much can I get rid of so I can serve you, Lord? So I can, I can walk before you. Now, it is possible to be a Christian, be here tonight, and you've lulled yourself into thinking that it's okay to live in the gray. I understand that. But here's the problem. Here's what's so dangerous about thinking that way. Because when you lull yourself into thinking it's okay to live in the gray, you know what happens? The darkness of the world 
it doesn't look that dark anymore. It's really not that dark. When you get over the grave, it's, it's, it's really not that dark. And after a while, you begin to think that the works of darkness, they are really not that bad. You don't need to expose them. In fact, some of the things you kind of like to do, it's kind of all right, you know. And what happens is you get lulled to sleep spiritually. You become a, a spiritual Jonah. And if you remember Jonah, he tried to flee from God, which already tells us he was in a bad state. He heard, he heard God and he went the opposite direction. So he was already in a bad spiritual place. But he gets on a ship, fleeing, going in the opposite direction, heading towards you know, Tarsus, you know. And you remember, of course, that there was a storm hit. But they couldn't find Jonah. Why? He was asleep in the hull of the ship. How could you be? I mean, this is a massive storm. How could you be asleep? Well, because his physical condition was simply an outward manifestation of his spiritual condition. He was spiritually asleep. In fact, the guys woke him up and said, what do you mean, oh sleeper? What are you doing? And of course, they find out that he's the problem. And, you know, he gets thrown overboard. And God, of course, you know, gives him a deliverer, a big fish. And you know the whole story. But Paul, I think here, is saying, could that be you? Could you have allowed yourself to fall into a stupor? Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead. In other words, you're acting like you used to be before you were a believer, dead in trespass and sin. But you're becoming worldly. You need to come back to the Lord. He'll, he'll give you his light. He'll give you his grace once again. And so maybe that's you tonight. If it's you tonight, you know, tonight, then I would say to you, just in the quietness of your heart where you sit, just repent, get right with God. Again, in the book of Revelation, Jesus said to the lukewarm church, he said, go back to your first works. Go back to your first love. Don't be content living in the gray. Don't be content with living a nominal Christian life. Don't fall into the world. Listen, you left the world. Why would you want to go back to it? Run. Run the race with excellence. I have a great scripture verse for you, if that's where you're at this evening. Romans 13, 11. Paul says this, it's high time to wake out of your sleep, for now your salvation is nearer than we first believed. Listen, if you're a Christian, listen, Christ could come at any time. Wake up. And then he says this in the next verse, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of life. So if you're a believer, you've fallen into darkness, cast that off. You should be wearing the armor of God saying, let's go forward. Let's serve the Lord with zeal. A fresh start. And then in closing, maybe you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. You've never come to the light. Well, certainly the call goes out today. As we read this, arise from your sleep. Awake from the dead. Christ will give you light. He'll give you new life. Again, I shared this verse when we began. In John 8, 12, Jesus said this, I am the light of the world. He who follows me, he who believes in me, no longer has to live in darkness, but can have the light of life. You can have that tonight. You say, well, what do I need to do? I, I like to say it's as easy as A, B, C. A, just admit you're a sinner. Just admit, be honest. The Bible says we all sin and come short of the glory of God. Admit you're a sinner and repent of that sin. The word repent means make an about face. The Bible says in Acts 3.19, repent that you might be converted and find refreshment, forgiveness from the Lord. So A, admit you're a sinner and repent of that. B, believe. You know, Romans 10.9, if you confess through the mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him dead, you can have new life. But it's also more than just, yeah, I believe that truth. It's actually living it. So that's C, that's commitment. Making a commitment to Jesus Christ. It's coming with an honest heart right now, tonight, and saying, I need to be right before God. Making a commitment. Jesus put it this way in, in Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. If any man would follow me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. So that's moving than just saying, I believe facts. That's saying, I'm sold out. I'm making a commitment to you. Do you ever wonder why you're here on earth? It might sometimes feel as if it's all too depressing and hopeless, but within the family of God, you'll find purpose that you never even dreamed of. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is making his way through the book of Ephesians where you'll find so much purpose, you'll be bursting with it. Here's just one example found in Ephesians 2.10. 
For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Not only do you have a purpose here on earth, but God also has gotten those good works ready for you ahead of time. He's just waiting for you to say yes and step in. And there's no better place to say yes than in a community of believers. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Pastor Ron Hint and Calvary Houston. Are you in the Houston area? We'd love to see you here next time you get a chance. We meet every Sunday at 9 and 11 in the morning and on Wednesday evenings at 7. You can find our location and answers to all your questions at ltlradio.org. Once again, that's ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app, which you can find on our website, or you can listen to Larger Than Life podcast to stay connected. And with that, join us next time on Larger Than Life.